Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the 2016 Hack Summit. We're joined here by Nathan Mars, who is the creator of Apache Storm, which is an open source st streaming data processing engine. And Nathan developed Storm while he was working at Backtype, which was later acquired by Twitter. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great. So um, audience, this is going to be a fireside chat where you'll have the, the chance to interact with Nathan. Uh, by asking questions and upvoting each other's questions. And we've also created a few polls for you as well. Um, so I hope you have the chance to engage here and, and use this as an opportunity to learn from Nathan. So Nathan, maybe um, I kind of like to warm things up by having the audience get to know you and your background a little bit. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you first got into programming and what, what first got you inspired to become a programmer. Uh, I actually started programming when I was about 10 years old. Uh, I was really bored in math class, and I learned that you could program your graphic calculators. So I started off just making these really simple games on my uh, TI-82. And um, I actually remember the first thing I ever made. I was really, really proud of it. Remember, I was 10 years old at the time. you got to keep that in mind. Uh, it was just a program on the calculator, and it would just open up a menu. And the menu listed all the names of my friends. And I would hand my catheter to my friend. And they, of course, would scroll down and pick their name. And then the program would throw some like random insults at them. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever when I was 10 years old. Oh, that and is I, awesome. I remember those graphing calculators. I remember I, I couldn't afford one. And I was so envious. I wanted one of those graphing calculators. They were the coolest. Yeah. They, they were fun. I mean, you could, you could really program them. They had this language called uh, TI Basic and uh, you know, it had like this really small keypad, so there's all these shortcuts to actually enter all the commands. And uh, I, I programmed it so much that I, I knew it by muscle memory. Like it was like F three 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 to do an if then statement, and you know all the different uh, things. And later on, I graduated to the or graduated to the uh, the TI eighty nine, which was a much more powerful uh, calculator. And I actually got into um, I think when I was like fifteen, started doing some assembly programming on the TI eighty nine which let you make uh, well, much more sophisticated uh, games. But very quickly, actually, uh, you know, I, 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 I kind of transitioned from, from just wanting to make these games to uh, just really enjoying the act of programming itself and, you know, what makes a good program, how do you abstract things, and how do you deal with complexity and all that stuff. And that's what I really fell in love with and continues to inspire me to, to this day. That's amazing. Wow. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, your work at Backtype. So maybe you could mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about what you did there and, and how that led to uh, the development of Storm and what Storm is all about. So Backtype, uh, Backtype was a really remarkable company. Um, we were very small. It was only uh, five of us. And the whole story of Backtype is just a one and a half year story, you know, 18 months. Um, before we were acquired by, by Twitter. So it was a one and a half year story from the time I joined. Uh, before I joined, it was just the, the two founders. Uh, and this was like seven years ago. So this was back when um, big data was still, you know, the Wild West where, you know, all we had was Hadoop and a few questionable NoSQL databases and no one really knew what they were doing. Um, and at that time, in that one and a half year period, um, we built this product, um, which was a social media analytics product. Um, and we, the idea was to help businesses uh, understand the impact they were having on social media. And we were very focused on this, on this idea of connecting the loop. Um, so let the business see how is their social media stuff affecting the core metrics that they actually care about. So for like a brand like Coke, all they really care about is brand exposure. Um, but then maybe uh, for a real retail company, um, what they care about is how much, how many sales are they getting that are leading in from their social media campaigns. And so we would integrate with things like Google Analytics uh, to connect that loop and let them see, okay, this tweet you sent led to these sales or led to this uh, number of user registrations on your site. Uh, and at that type, um, we had to analyze a lot of social media information, which is a lot of data. I think we had like, 10 to 12 data sources. Um, we had, I think, by the time we got acquired, we had, uh, I don't remember exactly, over somewhere over 30 terabytes of data, which um, 
doesn't sound like that much now, but back then that was, you know, that was some serious data to deal with, especially with the technology at the time. Uh, we managed a uh, 100 to 200 machine cluster. Um, we made heavy use of spot instances on AWS, which is why we had that, that variance. And we processed somewhere around 100 million or so messages a day. Um, and we did this all with only five, five people. Um, we really had complete mastery over um, our data processing. And uh, we really, really accomplished a lot um, in a very small time frame. Uh, and that's kind of leading into like, how does this all influence the development of Storm? Uh, the reason why we were so productive at Factype um, was it wasn't really so much what we were doing, but what we were not doing. Um, and what we were not doing was hitting all the pitfalls that everyone else was falling into, and really still are even to this day. Um, back then, I was developing the kernels of what I would later call the Lambda architecture, um, which, among other things, helps you avoid some very, very serious complexities that are endemic uh, to most data architectures. And so Storm was developed as something that could fit in as one of the major pieces of an implementation of a Lambda architecture. Uh, before I made Storm, um, you know, we had been doing real-time processing for a long time. I mean, that's what our, our whole product was about. Um, but all we really had to work with were some pretty ghetto queue systems, and uh, we had to make you know the individual worker processes manually, and we would string everything together and as best as we could, and and use databases to store state. Um, and it was pretty complex and it was pretty messy, and so Storm was a very natural generalization of that that would um, help us avoid those complexities. Great, thank you. So when you launched Storm and you open sourced it um, and you eventually uh, kind of uh, joined with Apache and made a, an Apache project, um, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of audience members who may be uh, working on their own open source projects right now and may have aspirations someday to get traction with their open source project. So what are some kind of uh, growth hacks, I guess, you use in terms of how do you actually get traction with an open source project? Um, <clears throat> well, I can I can kind of relate what was successful for me. Um, I think the, the most important thing you have to do as a developer, um, and this is just in general, whether or not you're doing open source, is you need to learn to communicate to other engineers. Um, and it's not as simple as just you um, splitting out a bunch of technical specifications. Like that doesn't help. That doesn't help anyone. Like you need to learn how to take someone who has no interest in your project, who knows nothing about it, and there's multiple stages. Like first, they need to gain an appreciation for your project, for the problem it solves, and, and the value your project provides. And then from there, you need to be able to take them from there to them being able to use it at a very basic level and then grow from there. Um, the best way to learn and communicate is to blog. Um, try to get yourself in Hacker News, get feedback, and you will learn very quickly um, uh, how you're communicating wrong. Um, and then you'll, you'll start to learn and, 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 and uh, how to communicate correctly. Um, it's actually, um, it actually is kind of counterintuitive, the right way to communicate. And um, if you actually look at how communication and writing is taught in schools, it's taught like absolutely the wrong way. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that people are not naturally good communicators, especially with technical material. Um, in terms of specific things to being successful in open source, um, in terms of getting traction, um, well, the communication thing uh, is important because people are very impatient. So you need to, to communicate well and communicate concisely to kind of move them along the uh, interest chain so that they go from knowing nothing to being interested to being able to use it. Um, a lot of that is just writing really good tutorials and really good introductory stuff. Um, and a lot of that is just making your project really easy to use, really easy to set up. Um, I remember with Storm, um, before I released Storm as open source, I spent probably six straight weeks full time writing documentation for the project um, and simplifying how it's installed um, so that you can very, very, very quickly 
just take it and run it locally and get these sample topologies that I provided uh, running on your computer. Um, another big thing with open source is, um, and this, this is probably the hardest thing to deal with for any project, is social proof. Um, the unfortunate thing about our industry is that um, it matters a lot for someone to adopt your project, who else is using your project. Um, and of course, when, uh, when you initially launch a project, you have no users. So it's this kind of chicken and egg problem of how do you, how do you get those initial users? Um, I kind of hacked it myself with Storm. Um, I kind of uh, worked around the whole problem. Uh, one of the big reasons why the Twitter acquisition was really appealing to me is because um, you know, even though I had completely developed Storm at Backtype, um, uh, being able to launch Storm using the Twitter brand was really appealing because then I automatically had that social proof, uh, or at least a certain level of it, from launch. Um, it also helps market the product and get a lot of exposure. Um, at the end of the day, like people listen when a big company releases open source project, um, whether or not that company got to be big because of their technical know-how. Um, so. Yeah, I kind of said a lot of things, but those are some of the key things uh, to keep in mind. No, that, that's great. So, so let's think about, let's say you're a developer in the audience that doesn't work for a big, well-known company like Twitter, and they've got mm -hmm. their open source project, yeah. and they want to get social proof. Yeah. How, how do you think they could get social proof? Uh, if, you're, if you're small, uh, like, I mean, you don't, have, you don't have that like hack that I was able to make use of. Um, you got to take it slow. Um, so actually, the last thing you want when you don't have social proof is lots of exposure. Um, <laughs> it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, um, but the problem is, is that, and it's the same thing with startups, which is one of the advantages of being small and unknown is that you can try things out and fail, and it's okay. It doesn't matter because the only people who are even going to notice is the very small people who even happen to know about your product in the first place. And so if you have a small project and you haven't really done that much open source before, the thing you're most likely to fail at is the communication of your project. So if you if you like just like try to get tons of exposure for your project and you succeed, but you don't communicate it well, you'll just turn off everyone to your project. And you'll make it 10 times harder to get those people to look at your project again in the future. Um, so it's, it's important just to be slow, like find the early adopters, the people, um, the people who actually will evaluate your stuff based on its technical merits and not based on secondary things like social proof. Um, and just focus on them and getting them to understand your project and use it. Um, and it's, it's just like, you know, it's just like doing a startup, like work closely with them, uh, get, you know, get as much feedback from them as you can, understand their needs, what problems are they applying your project to, um, and gear everything towards converting those people. And then hopefully, you know, you can start your Powered By page and list some uh, smaller projects or smaller companies using your stuff, uh, and then you grow from there. Um, and eventually, you know, get like a bigger company to use your stuff. Um, and then once you get the ball rolling, it'll become much easier to get, uh, to get more adoption. There's this this hack that entrepreneurs use when fundraising, which is that they they ask for advice rather than asking for money, yeah. And it, and it seems to have an an, an impact on investors in that investors look less critically at the startup. So do you think that that same technique applies well to open source development too? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you mean like talking to your asking your potential users for advice? Yeah, or feedback on your project. Like you know, we're not launching this yet. You know, it's, it's in private beta or private alpha, but I just want to see what you think of this. Well, I think that um, the effect it will have is it will, especially in the early days of a project, like your users need to feel that you're really responsive and will quickly address any issues that they have. Because they, they will have issues. They know it. You know it. Everyone knows it. Um, like, no project is ever complete, uh, and certainly not on its first release, when it's first hitting a, a wider audience. Um, so giving them that confidence is really important. Um, and so ask, you know, specifically asking them, what are your needs? What are your issues? 
um, will will give them that that confidence and, and make them make them less scared to uh, to try your stuff out. Makes sense. Yeah. So one of the topics that uh, um, that I think might be an interesting conversation for us is the whole irrationality of the industry with respect to tech hiring and mm -hmm. coding interviews. So so yeah. what are your perspectives on this subject? Uh, <laughs> I have a lot to say about uh, the way re uh, recruiting is done and the way interviews are done for uh, for software engineers. Um, In fact, actually, we've actually had a couple speakers touch on this already. So it, it really, I think, dovetails well with what we've talked about so far at yeah. the summit. So please go ahead. Basically, to sum it up, uh, the current, or you know, the, the, the common, you know, the common uh, processes used for hiring make no sense whatsoever. Um, I, the common process used is uh, to evaluate ability using a whiteboard coding interview. Um, some people uh, have, I guess, improved somewhat by not using an actual whiteboard and letting someone use an actual computer. But either way, it's you have to work on some cute algorithm problem with the person watching you and asking you questions while you're trying to figure out this problem. Um, so, um, uh, the problem with this process is that it's just not effective. Um, it has lots of false positives and lots of false negatives. Um, just to give like just you know anec some anecdotes, um, the two. Two of the smartest people and two of the best programmers I ever worked with, um, I interviewed them, and they uh, they completely bombed my. This is back. This is back before I saw the saw the light when I was still doing these ridiculous interviews. They completely bombed, like like horrible. Like they actually looked like they were like they had never programmed before. Like they knew nothing about computers um, because they just got nervous, you know, and they froze up and they weren't able to do the things they usually do. Um, so that, there's that aspect of it, like the environment has nothing to do with the actual environment in which you have to do programming, which is you're by yourself, you're not under time pressure, you have time to think and delve deep and look things up on the internet while you work and all this stuff. Um, the other thing is that the problems that are done in these whiteboard coding interviews have absolutely nothing to do with what the actual job will be. Like they're typically these like cute algorithm problems, um, Reversal like, linked list, that kind of stuff. Reversal linked list or dynamic programming or whatever, like whatever cute problem the, the person is giving that for some reason they think, anyway, it has nothing to do with the job. Like I know like front end developers who have to do these like algorithm questions, but they're not going to have to, they probably will never have to do a difficult algorithm in their job. So why are we asking them algorithm questions? Like the main skills of software engineering are forming good abstractions and avoiding complexity, which uh, giving someone an algorithm question tells you nothing about that person's skills in that regard. Like the way an, an, uh, a recruiting process should work is you need you should simulate the actual work environment as best as you can, so that you get as good of an idea of how will they perform in the actual work environment. Um, and it just it like it drives me crazy that it's it's so widespread the whiteboard coding interview when it's very clearly ineffective. Um, the the process that I like using, which I mean, no process will ever be perfect. You can't actually. I mean, short of doing like a, you know, hiring them temporarily for one month, um, you can't actually like perfectly simulate the work environment. But you can certainly do a lot better than the whiteboard coding interview. The main thing I like to do, which I think does give you insight into someone's ability to form abstractions and avoid complexity, is a take-home project. Um, give them a, a short take-home project. Um, something I've used many times in the past is have them implement a blackjack. Um, and you know, it's command line. It should, shouldn't take them that long. Um, and you know, it's it's a small project, so it's not hard to to complete. But it's big enough that they have to like do programming stuff, like make, you know, different functions and classes and tie things together and hopefully write some tests and and do all that stuff. So, so you do get an idea of how good of a programmer they are. Um, the other nice thing about the take home project is that it's actually less work for the company because instead of having to do a one hour 
coding interview, you give them the project, they do it on their own time, and then you spend you know, 15, 20 minutes reviewing the project. So it's actually much less time that you spend as a company. And do, um, do, you, wor do you worry that they might be uh, not necessarily doing all the work themselves, asking others to help them improve it? Is that an issue at all? It's, it's well, OK, it's an issue. You're asking about them cheating, right? Well, so the, the, it, it could be cheating, or it could just be, hey, here's my best attempt. But I'm going to validate that against some friends before I send this off for this very critical job that I really, really want. Yeah. Well, what you what you don't want is them, um, uh, what them just like copying some other blackjack from the internet. Uh, but if if they did that, like they wrote it themselves, or then they got other people to look at it and help them improve that, that's that's great. That's what they should be doing on the job. Right, like looking stuff up, looking up best practices, getting feedback from people. That means they're doing the job. They're writing good code. Um, obviously, cheating, like you got to worry about it. Um, but uh, I mean, I've, I've done the product thing like many times, and I don't think I've ever had an instance of cheating. Um, but certainly, that's not the end of the process, right? Um, um, so, uh, just to like another thing we do in our process is once people have kind of. Once we've like talked to them and, and we like them and we see a culture fit and we've done this project and see that they have technical ability, the last stage of our process is actually just bring them in and we work for them, work with them for like half a day. Um, and, they, and, and the way that works is that uh, it'll be like, uh, you know, let's say three of us at our company and then the candidate and we have some small project to do um, and then we have the candidate actually lead the project. So we let them know like what are our capabilities, what are our tools, and they 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 lead it. Um, and so when you're working directly with someone and coding directly with them, like, it'll be pretty apparent if they cheated on the project. Um, and the other nice thing about that last step of the process um, is that um, then you can see the other aspects of working with them. So one thing I like to do is challenge them and criticize them, and see how do they react to that. Um, um, and, and you're seeing how they react to it in the context of actually writing programs, uh, which is actually relevant to the actual job. Um, so, so anyway, I do think the cheating stuff is not really a big concern, um, and it's something that will uh, 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 you, you'll be able to figure it out later. And, and do you uh, care what stack they know? Is is that factor in at all? Uh, well, in theory, no. Um, all that matters is that their skill of a programmer. Um, any competent programmer should be able to learn whatever stack you have. Um, uh, so that shouldn't matter. But in terms of actually doing the uh, the interview process, um, they will need to be able to code in something that you are familiar with and are able to evaluate. Um, I mean, I personally know a lot of programming languages, so I give people like a lot of choice. Um, but it will vary from company to company. Um, but I think beyond the programming language, it doesn't really matter for the uh, the interview process. And certainly any other technologies, I just don't even care about. Um, so if you're if you're an individual developer in the audience, yeah, would you worry about keeping your skills quote unquote sharp by learning the latest and greatest stacks so that you could be more marketable as a programmer and potentially have access to a wider range of jobs? Or are the best jobs out there ones who don't really care what stack you're good at? Um, well, that's a that's a more more broad question over how does the industry at large think about things, which, I mean, I personally don't think about these things the same way the industry does. I mean, as you know, I try to explain with my view on uh, uh, technical interviews. Um, I don't know. I'm not one of those people uh, who thinks that way. Um, I certainly, pro I mean, I, I can certainly see that um, that. Uh, Staying sharp on these tools and knowing the stacks that the companies are using will greatly increase your chances of getting that job that you want. Um, now, is that the right thing for the companies to be doing? I don't think it is. Um, I think that's more up for debate. Um, but I mean, there is there is the um, ideal thing that we as an industry should be shooting for, um, and then there's the reality, which is very different. And certainly, as a developer, where you're you know trying to get a job and live your life, you have to you have to work with the reality and not with the ideal world. Um, as someone who's you know building my own company, um, I'm fortunate where I'm able to see the mistakes that other companies are making and do it differently and gain a small competitive advantage that way. Um, but certainly as an employee, um, you, you don't have that luxury. 
Makes sense. Yeah. So um, let's talk real quickly about closure, and then we'll go from there to uh, taking audience questions. So, so you've said in the past that closure is quote unquote the best programming language ever designed. Um, yeah. What is it that you like so much about Clojure? Um, <clears throat> Clojure, Clojure has a philosophy, um, and its philosophy is very sound. Um, and the creator of Clojure, Rich Hickey, is probably the best programmer I've ever seen. Um, Clojure, a lot of people will go on about you know it being a Lisp and then going into all the like blind Lisp. Lisp dogma stuff. Um, Clojure is a Lisp, and it does gain a lot from being a Lisp. Uh, but more importantly, it's just really, really well designed. Um, it embraces um, uh, this idea of immutability and functional programming, where functional programming means programming without uh, side effects. Um, and that really, really has a huge impact on reducing the complexity of programs and making it much easier to reason about programs. Um, I mean, it's not hard to see. Like, It's much easier to reason about a function when all you need to understand the function is in the function itself. We don't have to worry about other state which could exist elsewhere or could, uh, or could affect it. Um, but then just besides that, Clojure is really, really well designed. Um, it's extremely elegant, and it's elegant all throughout. Like, There is very there's less cruft in that language than in any software tool I've ever used. Like it is really beautiful. Um, so it's just it's just a great it's just a great language. I love it. I've been doing it almost exclusively for six years now, um, and it's it's I mean it's it's taken me. The thing about Clojure is that you're not going to pick it up and then immediately be the super programmer with it, um, especially if you're coming from like. You know Java or Python or something um, where you do use a lot of mutability. Um, it, it takes a while for your brain to adapt to that way of programming, and it takes a while for you to then to realize how much unnecessary state you were using before, and how much that how how that made things so much more difficult. Um, like it probably took me like a year, year and a half, till I really felt like I got it. And it probably took me another two years after that to feel like, OK, I, I've achieved some level of mastery over this language. But man, once you reach that level of mastery, like, like you really do feel like Superman. Like, You can do really amazing things. And you do amazing things because the philosophy of closure and the language helps you avoid those complexities that you were previously falling into before. Um, and that's, that's what really makes you a lot more productive. Wow. And, and from an industry perspective, where is Clojure head, heading from a trending perspective? Is it is is the adoption significant right now? Is it trending in a positive direction? What are you seeing right now? Oh yeah, it's trending in a very positive direction. Uh, they just they just released the uh, state of Clojure survey. Um, actually, what's really growing is the usage of Clojure Script, which is uh, Clojure that tar that targets um, JavaScript, so it can run in, in browsers. Um, some of the work they're doing in the Clojure Script community is really 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 cool. Um, uh, yeah, there's this project called Ohm, Ohm Next, which it's doing like really innovative stuff with uh, UI programming. Uh, but just in general, um, yeah, it's getting more adoption. I mean, I don't think it's nearly as big as Scala is, and certainly not nearly as big as Java is. Um, but what's important is that um, the Clojure team, they're not, um, they're very focused on just doing really, really solid um, work on the language. Like they're not adding features just to satisfy everyone so that they can maximize growth. Um, that would actually harm the language technically, even if it led to more growth. Like I really like that they're just very focused on this is our philosophy, we're sticking to it, um, and we're going to make this the best possible language in a technical, from a technical level uh, possible. Okay, great. Well, let's go to some audience questions here. So the number one question with 51 votes is from Ruben. Mm -hmm. And Ruben asks, can you suggest good books about big data? <laughs> I wonder if uh, such a book might exist, Nathan. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. 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 Sorry, your audio broke up a little bit there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. 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 I don
I, I think I think something changed maybe on your end because it's 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 at least for me it's hard to hear you. Um, there might be some feedback or static or something in the mic. Can, can you hear me now? Uh, still bad. Uh, audience, are you also hearing the feedback or is it just me? Maybe it's just my issue. Um, so the audience will, will let us know in about twenty seconds because they're actually behind us. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, that explains why the chat is. Uh... Yeah, this is this is this is the oh, benefits of, of YouTube uh, streaming, right? Is that you know the Hangout gets streamed to YouTube, then YouTube processes it and it takes twenty seconds, and then the audience hears it. So okay, now so now the audience is streaming it, but now it actually sounds better. So at some whatever you did, it fixed it. So so you can keep going now. So let's go back to the question. I didn't do anything. Well, the, the audience just woke up there. So 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 can you suggest good books about big data? Hmm. I wonder if there's a good book out there. What do you think, Nathan? <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I mean, obviously, I'm gonna mention my book. Um, I mean, honestly, like, I haven't really read that many. Uh, I, 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 I don't even know if I've read any of the the, the recent big data books. Um, so I can't really, fortunately, I can't really suggest anything. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the books are just about like specific technologies. So I'm, you know, if you want to learn that specific technology, I'm sure anything that has good Amazon reviews is probably gonna be good at introducing you to that. Um, I mean, my book was different because I, my book is absolutely not about individual technologies, but it's about um, um, just uh, just the general principles of building big data systems, um, and just kind of all the lessons I've learned over doing this for a very long time. Um, so the book is titled, by the way, "Big Data Principles and Best Practices of Real Time Data Systems." That's the name of the book, mm -hmm. and we'll also paste that into the chat window for you. So let's go to the next question. So the next question is uh, from John with 55 votes. Are developers better skilled than they were 20 years ago, or the tools and frameworks just better? Uh, I say the uh, the tools and the frameworks are, are better. Well, I don't know. I wasn't I I wasn't a professional programmer 20 years ago, so it's hard for me to say like what's the relative skill. Um, the thing is, like, programming has become so much more accessible in, in the past 20 years. Like, so many more people can do it and jump in that I would guess, actually, that programmers have become much less skilled. I mean, just as, just as the fact, just because so many more people are doing it. So the, that'll naturally bring the average down. Um, but definitely the tools and frameworks have certainly gotten better. Um, I mean, there's no question about that. Um, that said, though, um, there were some pretty ridiculously innovative things that um, that happened a very long time ago that the industry has still not caught up with. Um, I've actually been studying Common Lisp recently, um, kind of looking at it for inspiration and just to just more broaden my perspective on programming and just how can you express your programs. Um, certainly, uh, uh, you never want to be completely, you know, the tools you use, especially the programming language you use, is literally the lens through which you think about problems. So being able to expand that lens uh, can only be good for you. Uh, so that's why I've been studying common lists. And man, there's some things in there that are so cool and let you just approach problems in such different ways. Uh, the two things that really stand out for me are continuations, uh, which are just an incredibly powerful uh, technique and abstraction, which are unavailable in most of the modern programming languages. Uh, and then Common Lisp has this thing called a condition restart system, uh, which is, uh, it's, it's solves, it, it, it's met, it, it solves the same problem as uh, exception systems do, but it's like 100 times more powerful. Um, uh, I really recommend everyone actually to take a look at Common Lisp, just, just not necessarily to program in it, but just to learn and expand expand your mind on uh, what what programming languages can do um, and, and, and see beyond the limitations of whatever programming language you happen to use for your job. Great, thank you. So, um, so we already answered the next question. What's your favorite programming language? Um, um, let's see, what all variety of Apache Storm applications you ever heard? I'm not, not sure if that's a valid question. What do you think? What all variety of Apache Storm applications you ever heard? Does that well, I think he's asking, I think he's asking where has Storm been applied. Okay. Uh, 
that's actually been one of the most satisfying things about building and growing storm is seeing it just permeate like every industry imaginable um uh you know it's used in social media uh analytics healthcare um like that blew my mind the first time i heard that people's like health information was flown through storm um I don't know something that's like that really affects people's lives. Um, that was cool. Um, it's used uh, one of my favorite actually. This is probably my favorite uh, company using Storm, which is the Weather Channel, just because it's just so it's just so perfect that the Weather Channel is using Storm to process data. Um, uh, Storm is used. I mean, it's it's just it's a really big international project. Um, it's it's really heavily used by like all the big Chinese companies, which I never really understood. Like, why did it get so popular in China? Um, but it did, so I'm certainly happy about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 basically used in every industry imaginable. I mean, stream processing, real time processing is such a generic thing that pretty much everyone needs to deal with. So that's why it has such wide uh, usage. Great, thank you. So we'll come back to the audience in a second here. Um, just a few more questions from me here. So I think it might help to get our audience up to speed about just the concept of a Lambda architecture, because not everyone may be familiar with that. Yeah. So can you briefly describe what that is from the get-go? Um, yeah. So Lambda architecture, um, Lambda architecture, the development originates from just a few basic observations of the data processing systems and pipelines that that people build, um, which was basically universal, or well, it's, it's always been. This has always been. It's always been the most common way um, to build to build these systems. Um, so, like one thing that's always been really striking to me is um, like this industry, um, like both the industry and academia, has done amazing work with. Uh, fault tolerance, and specifically machine fault tolerance. So building systems that are resilient to disk failures and machines going down or any of the number of errors that can happen. And there's all these really complicated algorithms that allow it to recover and get back to a working state. It gets really amazing technology. <clears throat> but that means absolutely nothing if your systems are not tolerant to human mistakes. Because um, there's one thing that we all know in this industry is that bugs happen, they happen pretty frequently, and they go to production. So it doesn't matter how much machine fault tolerance you have if the slightest human mistake can send everything crashing down and corrupt everything you have. Um, and one of the really big, um, uh, probably the biggest um, area in which... Uh, this changes the way you do things is how do you store your core state, the source of truth of your applications? Um, traditionally, um, for, for decades, people have been doing it in these really big read, write, mutable databases, you know, CRUD, like everyone knows CRUD. These are the four core operations of database, create, read, update, delete. But if you can update and delete data, that means a mistake can update and delete data. And since mistakes are inevitable, that means you are in an architecture like that inevitably corrupts the database. It's guaranteed. Um, that's a really big deal. Um, like you have to design systems with greater human fault tolerance than that. Um, and so that leads to one of the core principles of land architecture, which is your source of truth should be an immutable append only uh, list of events. And then from there, there are some other really important observations um, about traditional architectures, where besides the, um, you know, not having an immutable source of truth, they, uh, um, the way they work is they have a very large database representing their state and the views that they serve uh, for queries, um, and they incrementally update that state as new data comes in. Okay? It's incremental. You update it as data comes in. Um, and this is in contrast to an altern alternate way of computation called recomputation, where you look at all your data at once and then compute your views from scratch. 
Um, and it turns out that large scale re, uh, random read, random write databases have some pretty crazy innate complexities. Um, and a lot of people don't realize how crazy they are because they've lived with them for so long. But there's no reason that you have to live with these things. Um, one of the big ones is um, a random read, random write database must do this thing called online compaction. Um, it's a database just cannot like perfectly update its indexes so that it's the most compact way possible as you're doing writes. So you do things different ways with like a write ahead log and you append to your indexes. So occasionally you need to go and compact things so that you don't run out of space um, with a bunch of stuff which you're not even using anymore. Um, so on, the thing about online compaction is it's a very, uh, it's, compaction is a very intense algorithm. It will, so that, that means that your, your, your database is running normally and then occasionally it has to um, do this very intense task which consumes a lot of the resources of the machines. So something that I've personally experienced and um, so many people have experienced when using these distributed random read, random write databases is compaction starts, um, it overloads the cluster and then the whole cluster goes down. It's brutal. Um, and it's a hard thing, it's, it's inherently complex because it's, it's always there. It's, it's always this thing that's waiting to spring up and, and take everything down. I mean, you know, I mean, there are ways to manage online compaction. Um, basically what you have to do is you need to understand how many resources it will take away from your cluster or, or take away from an individual machine. Um, and then you need to make sure you have enough capacity so that um, it, it won't, so that you can handle the extra processing cost of compaction. Um, and then, but then more than that, um, you know, in a distributed cluster, you got to make sure you have to schedule the compaction so that the compactions don't happen at the same time. Um, so you want to stagger the compactions. Um, but then you also need to know, okay, how long does it take to compact? Because then if too many compactions overlap with each other, that might take away me more resources um, than you intended and then cause, cause this uh, cascading failure. So it is manageable, but it's operationally very, very burdensome. Um, and Lambda architecture does not require online compaction for the vast majority of its state. And it's actually possible to implement it so that you don't ever need online compaction at all. That's a really big deal. Another one of these complexities um, is, um, is dealing with eventual consistency. Um, eventual consistency, I'm not gonna get into the whole cap theorem Thing. I'm sure people have heard of it, um, but um, basically, if you want your systems to be highly available um, in something like you know, like a like you know, like Amazon, like an online user-facing application where the user is doing things that need to synchronously take some action or return some results, um, if you want to always get results and not get errors, the best you can do is a thing called eventual consistency, which means sometimes the results you get don't reflect all the previous events. Basically, dealing with eventual consistency in a fully incremental architecture is a nightmare. Um, it is one of the most complex things you will ever see in this industry. Um, and it is so, like, it is completely unreasonable. Like, no one should be okay with this. Um, the thing is that if you insist on using a fully incremental architecture, you have no choice. Um, like, if you want eventual consistency, you have to do these very complex things, which are extremely error prone. And if you have an error, you end up corrupting your database. It's a disaster. Um, Lambda architecture um, has a much saner way of dealing with eventual consistency. Like, it's not even close. Um, and th there's some other complexities of random read, random write databases. But, but those are some of the big ones that motivate an alternate architecture. And so with Lambda architecture, I started from first principles. So how do we, like, first of all, how do we even define what, what does the data system do? Like, what are we trying to accomplish? And it's actually really simple. Like the most general formulation of a big data system is the system that computes queries where a query is a function of every piece of data you've ever seen. Obviously, anything you'd ever want to do with your data can be expressed as a function that takes in literally your whole data set as input. And so you start from there. And so you, start, you literally start from there. It's like, okay, let me think. Can I actually just do that? Let me just literally Every time someone wants to do a query, I literally take my entire data set and run a function on it. And obviously that's not gonna work. Like if you have a 20 petabyte data set, 
you can't you can't run a twenty petabyte query every time anyone wants to know any little thing. Okay, that doesn't work. So then you think, okay, what's the simplest trade off I can make from there, so that I get closer to that dream of doing arbitrary functions of an on an arbitrary data set at arbitrary scale with an arbitrary latency constraint. And so you make these trade offs, and uh, you very uh, you inevitably res uh, get led to the little lambda architecture. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways a lambda architecture could implement. Like it's not just some static thing, uh, but the most basic lambda architecture is uh, you have two pipelines. One is all about recomputation, so recomputing things from scratch and producing these batch views, which are used to uh, serve your queries. Um, and these batch views are only uh, written to in batch, so there's no random writes. And so these batch views avoid all of those complexities I was talking about before. Uh, and then the second pipeline compensates for the fact that recomputation is a high latency operation and um, and kind of fills in the gap. So your batch views may be able to tell you all the answers you want up to three hours ago. And then your real time layer uh, fills in anything else you need to know from the past three hours. So that's the most basic form of web Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great explanation. So um, let's go back to the audience and take a few more questions here. So, um, so first question from uh, with uh, 24 votes is, please define big data. What does the term big data mean to you? Uh, uh, define big data. Sorry, the, the, the audio uh, got a little bit uh, speed. Uh, oh, okay, uh, can, you hear me? can you hear me now? Uh, keep talking, I'll let you know. Okay, um, so I'd say big data is still bad, unfortunately. Something. Oh, what are we talking? About? Okay, how is it now? Uh, try again. Try uh, test, testing, yeah, it's, testing, it's, testing. It's good. It's good. Okay, uh, it's not a conference without a few technical difficulties. No, 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 it's all right. We have we have issues like this. <laughs> you know, this, this is it's like reality TV, right? You know. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, big data, I mean, I'd say it's, I mean, you could define it any way you want, but I'd say it's um, it's building systems um, uh, where you can't just store all your data in one machine. So it's databases. Um, it's once you've hit the limit of tr traditional databases where you just have one database and one machine serving everything. Um, that to me is is big data. Other people will probably have different definitions. Um, that's what it is to me. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to jump around in the questions here to see if I can find one that that I think would be interesting here. Um, let's see here. Um, here's a question from Costas, which is: Is bad data is bad hiring processes a telltale sign of a bad company necessarily, and is a good process necessarily a telltale sign? For a good company. Well, it's it's kind of weird. Like it's so endemic these bad processes that I wouldn't say is necessarily an indicator of a bad company, um, but certainly it will lead a company to become worse over time. Because obviously, if you're hiring and growing with a process that doesn't evaluate people well, um, even if your company is currently really good. Um, like it's not going to be able to maintain that level of excellence with a process that is not evaluating how good people are well. Um, I think a good hiring process could be an indicator of a good company. The thing is that that's like a very um, that's like a very secondary metric, I guess, in which to evaluate a company. I think like the ways um, it, I, I, I do think it is as important for a company to sell themselves with the candidate. Um, as you know, as it is for the candidate to sell themselves to the company, um, so um, I think it's it's always really good as someone looking for a job um, to act to see evidence of the quality of work that the company does. Um, and the best places to look for that are the company's open source um, and <clears throat> the company's engineering blog if they have one. Um, I think anyone who's really any company that's really serious about maintaining a really strong engineering culture will invest in both of those things. Um, and those are the things that I think those are the best things that 
an individual can look at to, to gauge the strength of the company's engineering. Great, thanks, Nathan. So while we wait for a few more questions from the audience, I'm going to ask you one about just kind of general software development processes. So you wrote a great blog post called Suffering Oriented Programming. Mm -hmm. And I'd love you to touch on the general philosophy behind this software development process. What 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 are people doing today that could that might be able to be improved on by harnessing some of these principles? Yeah. Well, so the philosophy uh, is kind of uh when I look back at like my evolution as a programmer, I think I went through a very similar evolution as a lot of programmers. You start off not knowing what the hell you're doing, um, and so you uh, you just do whatever 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 you can to get it to work because um, it's so difficult in the early days. I remember I was you know on my little graphing cassette, I was copy and pasting code like left and right because I had I had no idea that that was a bad thing. I didn't know why that would be a bad thing, but then like you learn like that's a very bad thing. Um, and you learn why it's a bad thing. And so then you get into reusing your code and, and making functions so that your code can be reusable. And then it's very natural to go from there to be like, wow, reusability is so awesome. Um, I should make things as general as possible so that they can handle my future needs. And then you go from there to this idea of uh, future proofing, which is this really, um, it's this really compelling idea, right? Like, let me write my code. Um, um, so it'll handle whatever I need to handle in the future. Um, uh, but the problem, uh, okay, so that's natural. And I went through I went through that phase for, for actually a very long time. That's probably the, the longest phase of my programming life. I was probably in that for 10 years. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a very common place that a lot of programmers are in now. Um, the problem, the thing I learned though, is that future proofing is a synonym for now complicating, which is a big problem. Um, and it doesn't really, uh, like if you're future proofing, that means you're doing something that you wouldn't otherwise do to handle the current use cases you're dealing with. Um, which means that you have some insight into what, what your specific needs will be in the future, even though those are not your needs now. And, and you don't definitely know what those will be your needs. Uh, and so I find that it, 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 uh, that leads to this like disease of, um, like overgeneralization and just making your code obtuse and hard to understand and complex and a lot of problems. So I transitioned from there into this idea of, well, I called, I called it suffering oriented programming for the blog post. Uh, but the basic idea is um, what are you, like everything should be about what are your use cases? Like what are the specific tangible things that you need to be able to do? Okay. And you have all your use cases and now you need to think of, Okay, what is the simplest way to unify those use cases into abstractions? Um, and it's kind of, it's actually very similar to um, the idea of statistical regression. You have a bunch of points in a graph. What's the simplest curve that fits that graph? The curve are the abstractions that you develop. And so my philosophy of programming is to stick, and, and I've become like more and more like uh, obsessive about this um, over time. Um, Never do anything if it's not a specific tangible use case right now. Um, and then you learn you learn all these like heuristics for like what makes a better like abstraction to unify those use cases versus not. Um, but the key thing is stick to your use cases. And then there's kind of this like whatever mantra that I put in the post, which is uh, first make it possible. So that means just get something working that handles your use cases. Okay. Then the next stage is then make it beautiful. So use your understanding of the use cases, your understanding of the problem space to make your abstraction simpler and have it fit that fit those use cases better. And then the last one is then make it fast. So then make it fast is then at that point when you understand uh, the problem space and you understand the abstractions that fit the problem space really well, then you can worry about the um, you know, whatever like micro optimizations that you need um, to, you know, make it fast. And, and most importantly, like any like broad performance characteristics are part of the make it beautiful and make it possible phase. Um, the make it fast phase is just, that's the appropriate time to actually do micro optimizations and profiling and things like that. I love it. You know, right before you spoke, we had uh, Greg Pollock from Code School here, and he was mentioning that they spent an enormous amount of time making a multi-tenant billing system for code school. 
that could support lots of different you know, client applications. At the end of the day, the, there was only one uh, ever tenant of that, right? There's only one client that ever used that application. They way over-architected it because they yep. were looking down the road and they thought, well, maybe one day we could use this. So let's invest all this engineering today. Yep. And exactly. it was all a waste. It was all a waste. And it, and funny because I see this pattern over and over again. I've I've been a victim of this myself as a software developer. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think as developers, we like to gold plate our products. And yeah. you know, a common theme that's been that's been here throughout the week also has been kind of you know whether or not TDD is appropriate for projects or not. And there's mm -hmm. been lots of opinions back and forth. Kent Beck was here earlier. He mentioned that now that he's been at Facebook for a while. Um, he, he believes that it should be used judiciously in the right scenarios, depending upon what reduces the amount of of, of time to market, essentially, for your products. Mm -hmm. um, and DHH has similar opinions. Do you, as we go off the air here, do you have any quick opinions on TDD? Do you use it personally? How do you approach uh, iter iterating on your code from a testing perspective? Uh, I, I do not follow TDD, although I certainly can see why it would be very useful for a lot of developers. Um, I think definitely if you have a team of developers that um, um, uh, I guess are less, uh, I don't know, less experienced, I guess, it can kind of, it can, kind of, it, it can, it, it can help you kind of uh, like stick to this, like focus on the use cases thing. It, it's a good way to do that. Uh, personally, like I very much, uh, I, th I think like, Iterative development and exploratory development is really important. Um, I do it in the REPL, in the closure REPL. Um, just try out different things. Um, I don't personally like write my tests first. Um, I just find that there's this like, especially when you're working on something that's a lot more difficult and more amorphous into what is the right solution, like you, can, you don't even know what the abstraction should look like that you should be testing. Um, so that's why I do a lot of experimenting in the REPL and um, just a lot of uh, Rich Hickey, he has this concept of called hammock time where you just sit and think. And most of my time spent programming is spent sitting and thinking because um, that's, that's the way you think through things and synthesize things and figure out what's going to work. And, and I just find that TDD is just, it's, it, it requires a level of tangibleness that you don't necessarily have at the time that you should be exploring. So, but I mean, it's not for me, but uh, um, I can, I, 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 I'm not against it. And I think that it can definitely work well for a lot of people. Great. Well, thank you, Nathan. Really, really uh, learned a lot in your session today. And thank you for being here. Audience, if you enjoyed uh, Nathan's chat today, please pick up a copy of his book, um, Big Data Principles, Best Practices of Real-Time Data Systems. And Nathan, are you available to take a few private questions from audience over the Hangout after we go off the air for a few minutes, or are you are you on a tight schedule today? Sorry, the uh, the audio cut out there. Uh, give, me, give me a thumbs up if it's okay, or a thumbs down if you're not. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to paste the Hangout link for our audience to join, and we'll be right back with our next speaker. So stay tuned. Please make a donation to our coding nonprofits if you enjoyed Nathan's talk. Nathan it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh,